So I've got a story for you. I went into the dentist for the first time in a long time, right? And I was like, ah, who knows what's gonna happen. I'm sure it'll be fine. And I sit down in the chair and uh, and it's already awkward. I don't know, something about the office and the people. It just felt awkward. It wasn't great. Was like, Whatever, let's just get this over with. So I sit down in the, in the chair, <laughs> you know, open up my mouth for the dentistry to happen. And the, the, the first thing, the very first thing that the dental hygienist says is, have you ever thought about bleaching your teeth? Get them a little more, a little more white? I mean, is that, is that rude? Is that... I drink a lot of coffee. Anyway, I just thought it was funny. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the video. My name is Mike. Uh, here on YouTube, I talk about lots of entertainment media. I have a soft spot for animation in particular. And today's video is very much more on the media studies side of things where I want to get into a little bit of theory of understanding media and we're going to do that through bad movies. You probably already know this, but bad movies are basically their own product category at this point. And just to be clear, when I say bad movies, I mean just any movies that are bad in an entertaining way. So there are lots of different terms that people will use for this. They'll, they'll call them like so bad they're good movies or, or HFS movies, which is uh, a little <laughs> initialism, uh, or they'll call them cult movies in some scenarios. Watching and talking about bad movies is extremely popular right now, especially here on the internet. Now this trend, it didn't begin on the internet, of course. Uh, it's sort of similar. We had like midnight movies that were a big thing in the 1970s and late 60s, I guess. Uh, and I think that film geeks in general have pretty much always just had a thing for seeking out and sharing really bad, old, <laughs> and obscure movies with their buddies. It's, it's not a new thing. And in terms of like making entertainment that is based around watching and making fun of these kinds of movies, well, gosh, Mystery Science Theater was doing that years ago, and I'm sure that there was some other version of that basic idea that was around on TV even before MST was a thing. But like I said at the top, this is a whole category now, both in terms of film production and people making new bad movies, and also film criticism and discussion. And I mean, heck, you're on YouTube right now, so you probably already know about Red Letter Media, their video series in particular, Best of the Worst, remains one of the biggest bad movie shows in town. It's it's just extremely popular. It's been popular for years. I didn't even realize this until recently, but there are so, so many other channels and podcasts and websites that have specifically made bad movies their focus. And don't worry, I'm not against any of this. I'm not trying to ruin the fun here. Instead, I, I want to try to add to it. I want to talk about what I think the real value of bad movies actually is, and it goes way beyond pure entertainment value. So first up, let's talk about just the surface level reasons behind the popularity of bad movies. Bad movies are funny to watch. <laughs> That's how so many of these movies like enter into this category because they, they're either like just really funny or they're interesting to watch. And a lot of the time they are funny or interesting specifically because in certain ways they resemble more typical movies while also getting the details of execution completely wrong, just flat out wrong, incorrect, bad. <laughs> And bad movies get these details wrong for two main reasons, I think. Number one, the filmmakers do not have extensive knowledge or an understanding of how to make a movie. And number two, the filmmakers do not have the resources they need to make the movie that they really want to make. So maybe they don't have the budget for it. Maybe they don't have like really great on-screen talent. They don't have access to good actors. Uh, they don't have the right equipment etc etc and honestly it is hard to get access to all that stuff which is part of why hollywood movies are so expensive to make and why it's such a competitive area most of the time it's not hard to like pick apart and analyze what the filmmakers behind these bad movies actually wanted to do there are so many bad movies that are just trying to directly mimic existing genres and tropes. For example, The Room, one of the most famous bad movies around, it wants to be a serious drama with really tense character dynamics. 
or, or Troll 2, another famous bad movie. It wants to be an 80s creature feature for a really broad audience. Then there's Birdemic, another famous one. Birdemic wants to be a horror movie, but more specifically, it wants to be uh, along the lines of something like The Birds or The Happening, where beyond the horror stuff, there's also an element of like cautionary tale behind the surface level story. And we have all seen so many professional movies in all of these categories that even without realizing it, probably, we're all well acquainted with the norms of those movies. We know the structures of each kind of movie and what kinds of characters they tend to include, what kinds of settings they tend to have. If I just say action movie, you probably have a pretty good idea of what that looks like, just, just in your head. You're maybe thinking about big explosions, like relatively thin character development, you know, a big bad, bad guy. <laughs> so even for someone who hasn't studied film, it's still fun to watch a bad movie that is aping or, or copying professional work and just in the process notice all of the deficiencies. Even if you can't articulate that, like for example, a movie took way too long to get to the inciting incident in the first act, you still intuitively know that something's wrong. Something just doesn't feel right. There's also just plenty of dumb fun in watching like bad acting performances. You gonna tell me where Ryan's hiding? You're all a bunch of gutless cowards. And listening to bad music direction. <laughs> because having grown up watching famous blockbuster movies and, and classic movies, whatever, it's very easy to take competence in these areas for granted. When we watch a professional movie, we expect the acting to be decent. We expect the music to fit what's happening on screen. But in the land of bad movies, anything is possible as long as it's incorrect. Bad movies can be much more surprising than a professional movie in this way. Like all of a sudden, you're not guaranteed like a typical three act structure. You are not guaranteed that the ending of the movie is gonna make any amount of sense. So all of that is is level one of bad movie value is just the, the pure entertainment factor. So what's the next level? What's level two here? It's education. I know, kind of unexpected, right? <laughs> Bad movies provide very clear and specific examples that you can point to while explaining a particular filmmaking concept. So let's say we're talking about uh, film lighting. At a basic level, the lighting needs to let the audience see <laughs> what's actually happening in the scene. It's especially important that the audience is able to see the actors' faces clearly because, believe it or not, Actors do a lot of their acting with their faces, <laughs> so the audience needs to see them, generally speaking. Beyond that, lighting should try to amplify the tone of a scene. Light and shadow can add depth to the frame and direct the audience's attention to specific portions of the frame. A scene in a bad movie where it's hard to see anything at all provides an opportunity to say, okay, here's why this is wrong and I'm very much in support of the educational potential of bad movies. People watch bad movies or they watch discussions about bad movies to laugh at the expense of someone else's failure and get some comedic value out of it. But once they're there, once they're watching this stuff, they might actually learn something about how movies are made and why specific decisions are made during the filmmaking process. But there's yet another level of value to all of these terrible movies, and it's not something that I hear getting talked about. Okay, so I need to set this up a little bit. Media delivers messages, and those messages can be surface level messages or they can be coded messages. Uh, surface level messaging, it's really easy to spot, and that's the whole point of it. The most basic example I can think of is like a, a TV show that has a moral at the end, the moral of the story, right? Characters will literally say what the point of the story is. The quest for youth, number one. So futile. Age and wisdom have their graces too. Coded messaging, on the other hand, lies underneath the surface. It can be messaging that the creator intended to be there, but has to hide it for one reason or another, like Shostakovich mocking Stalin's regime through music in a way that Stalin couldn't understand. <laughs> Coded messaging could also be something that the creator did not intend. For example, certain audiences might watch The Lion King and think that the movie is an endorsement of like divine rule 
and monarchy. It's safe to say that that is not what the team behind the movie intended, but regardless, that is the messaging that some viewers have found in it. For anyone interested in entertainment and, and narrative and media studies, analyzing coded messaging in different movies can be really interesting and a lot of fun. You can learn a lot about the filmmakers, and you can also learn about what the society that those filmmakers come from tend to value and how they're communicating those ideas through the work, either intentionally or unintentionally. The popularity of a major Hollywood movie can also give a sense for like the degree to which that movie's surface level and, and its coded messaging resonate with mainstream audiences. Think of something like Encanto. Encanto? Encanto? I've talked about that movie a lot. I still have no idea. Beyond the movie's fun songs and lovely visuals, audiences clearly agree with what that movie is saying about family, about mental health and individuality. Uncovering coded messaging and understanding it, it takes a certain amount of work. I mean, that's the thing with coded messaging. It has to be decoded first. But here, at long last, we come to the real value of so bad they're good movies. They reveal their own coded messaging without even knowing it, basically just by way of incompetence. And by extension, they can also reveal the coded messaging of the professional movies that they're trying to imitate. Hollywood movies, big professional movies, they can be pretty subtle when it comes to their coded messaging, but bad movies don't manage to hide much of anything at all. <laughs> So if we want to learn about the messaging of specific genres of movies, we can decode the professional movies. We can put the work in, do some analysis and do it that way. Or if we want a much easier time, we can just watch the bad movies that are mimicking that genre because the bad movies are gonna do a terrible job of hiding or obscuring that messaging. So as an exercise, let's take like the, the cop movie genre. It's definitely not the hardest genre to decode in the first place, but bad movies make it even easier. <laughs> so Best of the Worst has covered a few movies in this genre, and I think that two of them in particular, called Partners and Honorable Men, are going to help us out here. Partners is a movie about two police partners, maybe they're detectives, I forget, and it follows many of the cop movie tropes, like, you know, first-hand interactions with, with scummy criminals, or tension at home caused by the rigors of the job, and also, of course, the enduring bond between partners. This movie is very obvious in its general approval of cops, and within that, it suggests that the bond between partners is an acceptable context in which two heterosexual men can express affection for one another. Now, the other one, Honorable Men, this movie is even more blatant, I think, in its support of the idea that being a cop is like the best profession that any man could, could possibly have. <laughs> and an extension of that idea in this movie is that apparently women, especially young women for some reason, find cops irresistible. Call me at nine. I'd be glad to. Hey, Ryan. Why don't you come over for dinner tomorrow? Sure, but what about your dad? Oh, he won't mind. You're a cop. Yeah, he's older than me, but he's a cop. Now, <laughs> all of these messages, in my opinion, can also be uncovered in lots of different, like, big budget, you know, professional cop movies. Midnight Run is just jumping to mind right away. I <laughs> get nails a lot of that. But those messages are so much more obvious in the bad cop movies. Again, they're not doing the coding at all. And like I said, this is true pretty much across the board with bad movies. Based on whatever genre they're trying to emulate, and they're almost always trying to emulate an existing genre, they will accidentally reveal things about that genre as a whole. And that's really good news for anyone who wants to learn about entertainment media and, and how that media functions in our society. I would even say that bad movies are a kind of gateway to media analysis and media studies as a whole. Bad movies are still a great option for having some dumb fun. That's a-okay, I do it all the time. But if you're looking for more than that, the opportunity is definitely there. All media has effects beyond its original intentions. And discovering those effects, those messages, and those qualities is just endlessly interesting to me. And if it's interesting to you too, then you're in the right place. I, I try to do that kind of stuff a lot. Bad movies aren't just funny, they're tools. And I hope that I've given you something to think about the next time you sit down to watch the new Neil Breen movie. I've never gotten one of the physical discs. I want to get an actual disc 
mailed out by Neil Breen himself. I think that would be pretty, pretty great. Okay, that's all. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. I'm tired. I'm going to have some coffee and wait for more cars to pass by my window and make loud noise in the rain. I love that. There it goes. Yep, that's all. Uh, I stream sometimes. If you want to, if you want to come along for one of those, I'm, I'd be happy to have you. Um, otherwise, I have many other videos here on the channel. Some of them are very good. I know I didn't think I would say that, but some of them are pretty good. Thanks for stopping by.